So the talk will be on new results on cutting plane proofs for horn constraint systems. So in this talk, I'll introduce you to horn constraint systems. We'll talk about what cutting plane proofs are and what the new results are. This um, research was supported in part by the Air Force Office of Scientific Research through the grant number, and you can read that. So what is the goal of this talk? We want to analyze cutting plane proof systems for horn constraint systems. Okay, so let's talk about constraint systems and then we'll go to proof systems. Okay, so what is the constraint satisfaction problem? Okay, you have a three tuple X, D and C where X is a set of variables which we call the program variables. D is the set of their respective domains. So D1 is the domain for X1 and so on and C is a set of constraints or relationships among the program variables. The domains can be continuous or discrete and now I'll give you a few examples. So let's talk about Boolean systems. Here we are saying find an X belonging to B cube where B is true false such that these relations are satisfied. Then we talk about linear polyhedral systems. So here we are asking find an x belonging to r cube where r is a set of real numbers such that these two constraints are satisfied and finally we have integer polyhedral systems. So in this case we are asked to find a two tuple of integers such that those two linear constraints are satisfied. So we will focus on a combination of two and three linear polyhedral systems and integer polyhedral systems during this talk. So let's talk about polyhedral systems. Each constraint, each relationship is an inequality of the form ajx less than or equal to bj where x are the program variables. The collection, the conjunction of constraints can be represented in matrix form as ax less than or equal to b or ax greater than or equal to b. The domain can be continuous or discrete. So if the domain is continuous, it's called linear programming. If the domain is discrete, then it is known as integer programming. Okay. Now we discuss uh, or uh, enumerate the different types of constraints. A constraint of the form xi greater than or equal to bi or xi less than or equal to b, bi that when you multiply it by minus 1 it will be xi less than or equal to this is called an absolute constraint for the rest of the talk we are going to assume that the right hand side is always integ integral from from now on um, here are examples of absolute constraints so we are going to distinguish between positive and negative absolute constraints uh, in one of the proofs so i thought i'd just mention it here the next class of constraints are called difference constraints. Um, they are also called separation constraints in the literature, constraints of the form xi minus xj less than or equal to bij. So these are difference constraints. Here are some examples of difference constraints and a conjunction of such constraints is called a difference constraint system. I think many of you know that a difference constraint system has a fractional solution if and only if it has an integer solution assuming and that's why I said it's so important all the right hand sides are going to be integral from now on and difference constraints clearly subsume absolute constraints. The next class of constraints that we look at are called UTVPI constraints. I know it sounds exotic but it stands for unit two variable per inequality unit two variable per inequality constraints. So the constraint in addition to having xi minus xj, it can also have xi plus xj and minus xi minus xj. So it's a generalization of difference constraints. Here are some examples. A conjunction of such constraints is called a UTVPI constraint system shorthand UCS. Now this is important, this is where UCSs are different from DCSs. You can have a linear solution but no integer solutions and here is an example. Okay. It will take some time for you to, to check it out but this is, this is a well known example. So you can have fractional solutions but no integral solutions.
Then we come to the constraint system which is uh, the topic of today's talk Horn constraint systems. So Horn constraint systems have this form, okay. Uh, some examples will make it clear. Here are some examples of Horn constraints. So what is important to note is that you can have at most one positive, you can have no positive at all, multiple negative. So it's clear that they subsume, they are a generalization of difference constraints, but in a different way. UTVPI constraints generalize difference constraints, Horn constraints generalize difference constraints in different ways. Okay. Conjunction of such constraints is called a Horn constraint system. Now this is a very nice property, it was proved by V0 in the early 1980s that a Horn constraint system has an integer solution if and only if it has a fractional solution and this is a property that it shares with difference constraints. UTVPI constraints do not have this property. So consider the following Horn constraint system. This is an example of a feasible uh, system. You can look, you can see that this constraint, this uh, value satisfies all the, all the constraints. And here is an example of a constraint which is infeasible. And the goal of today's talk is to provide you proofs of infeasibility. How do I convince you that the system is infeasible? Okay, here is a proof. You add all the constraints together you will get 0 greater than or equal to 1. Any assignment which satisfies the original system must satisfy the new constraint and nothing can satisfy it. And so the original system is, uh, is infeasible or unsatisfiable. And what we will do in the talk today is to talk about how to arrive at this conclusion. Okay? So now we talk about proof systems. We want a proof system in general to be sound, I think, at least this audience, we all know what sound means, what complete means. And from our perspective, from the computational perspective, we want it to be efficient, which means we want it to be polynomially bounded in the size of the input. These are some characteristics that we want in a proof system. So all that I'm saying is a proof system for a language L consists of a set of axioms and a set of inference rules. The previous speaker mentioned this, okay. So we are going to be dealing with the refutability problem. So L is the set of unsatisfiable constraint systems. Instance X has a proof under a sound proof system only if it belongs to the language. And if the proof system is complete, then every instance in the language has a, a proof, okay? A proof system is efficient if the length of a refutation is polynomial in the size of the input system, and that's the primary focus. So. Uh, I think we all are familiar with proof systems in clausal formulas. I think I assume that all of you have seen them. In general, determining the feasibility of a clausal formula is NP complete. If any proof system can always generate polynomial sized proofs, uh, then you have NP equal to co NP, a very unlikely um, event. And all these refutations that, uh, that are listed here are sound and complete. Now we talk about refuting linear feasibility. In order to refute linear feasibility, I introduce only one inference rule called the add rule. It derives a new constraint by summing two constraints. So given this and this, these two relationships as your uh, premises, you can derive this relationship. That's what the rule says, okay? So for a linear refutation, we apply the add rule in various ways. Every inference is either applied to the original constraints or constraints that were derived as a consequence of applying the add rule. Okay. The last inference rule will derive a contradiction. So this is the add proof system for linear refutation. Here is an example. So you keep on, you add the constraint and you, you arrive at the, at the contradiction, okay? So one simple rule uh, that you apply over and over again. This is a rule called the MUL rule, the multiplication rule. And it says that I can multiply by a positive constant. It can multiply any relationship. So I'm given this linear relationship and I do this multiplication and, and infer this. 
there is no real need for this rule. You can accomplish what the mal rule does with the add rule. However, using the mal rule makes proofs or refutations more succinct. Okay. Now we are into refuting integer feasibility. We have two inference rules, the add rule which we had previously and a new rule called the division rule or the div rule. It derives a new con constraint by dividing the constraint by a positive integer. And here is the div rule. As you can see, we have divided both sides by D and on this side we are taking the ceiling function. Okay. It only works if AI by D is an integer for all I on the left hand side. Any integer assignment which satisfies the original constraint satisfies the new constraint. An integer refutation is a sequence of applications of the add and the div rule. Each inference can be applied either to the original constraints or to the derived constraints and the last inference rule is a contradiction. Okay, I think I have an example on the next slide. So let's talk about um, integer refutations and Horn constraints. A Horn constraint system has a linear solution as we mentioned before if and only if it has an integer solution. An integer feasible Horn constraint system is also linear feasible. An integer refutation of a Horn constraint system also proves linear infeasibility. The inference rules for integer feasibility can also be used in the proof of linear infeasibility. The advantage of using additional inference rules is that proofs can be shortened and that will be one of our first theorems. Here is a UCS, UTVPI constraint system. So it clearly doesn't have a linear refutation because it's feasible, but I'm able to show that it doesn't have an integer solution by the following refutation. So this is a, a refutation which establishes, I mean, we've used the div rule. Here is a place where we have used the div rule. And so we are able to arrive at, at a contradiction, which means that the system is not integer feasible. The, the cutting plane proof system consists of the add rule, the div rule and the mul rule. In our paper and in this talk, we will focus on restricted versions of this proof system. Restriction number one, you are allowed to use only the add rule. Restriction number two, you are allowed to use only the add and div rules. Restriction number three, you can use the mul rule, but you have to use a bounded constant. You cannot use arbitrary constants. And restriction number four, each constraint can be used at most once in the derivation of a proof or refutation. So this is what we will focus on uh, when describing our results. First type of refutation that we talk about is read once refutation. A refutation is said to be read once if each constraint is used at most once in the derivation of a contradiction. So when you put this restriction, clearly you will lose completeness. The input constraints can be used in at most one inference step and a derived constraint can be reused only if it is re-derived from new input constraints. It's equivalent to, you can think about it this way, once you use a pair of constraints in an inference step, you promptly throw them away. You can't use them anymore. The optimal length refu read once refutation problem is basically finding the, re the read once refutation of the shortest length using the fewest number of inferences. Just as we defined read once refutation, we have two other types of refutations called tree-like and dag-like. So what is a tree-like refutation? It is if the constraints that are being used in the refutation can be arranged as a binary tree with copies, if necessary, of the input constraints as the leaves and a contradiction at the root. I will give you examples of all three types and the optimal length tree-like refutation problem consists of finding the tree-like refutation with the shortest length. Uh, something very similar is dag-like refutation. Here you, you arrange the constraints to form a dag. Both tree-like and dag-like are sound and complete. The only difference is in the length, dag-like proofs are more succinct than tree-like proofs. Okay, And the optimal length dag-like proof problem is finding the dag-like refutation with the shortest length. So I want to give you some examples. Here is an unsatisfiable 2CNF formula. Don't worry, you'll have to accept it on faith that it's unsatisfiable. Here is a read once refutation of this 
particular formula. See, the contradiction is at the bottom. And what is important is you can see that this constraint is being used twice, but it is being re-derived using different constraints. The, these two are not the same, these are different. This is called a read once refutation. Now for the very same formula, we are going to look at a tree-like refutation. This is a tree-like refutation. We are using the same pair of constraints to derive this particular constraint, but it is, it is being re-derived. So you use them here and you use them here. This is a separate copy of this, okay. So in tree-like, you will count it twice. And finally, this is how a DAG-like refutation looks. You can see that the DAG-like refutation is, tends to be shorter than the tree-like refutation. So here is the uh, issue with the MUL rule. If you do not restrict the use of MUL, then you will always have a read once linear refutation, okay. So this is called as Farkas's lemma. What we do is we, we ask the question, suppose we restrict the use of MUL, what happens to the proof system? And our restricted read once refutation is one in which you can use the add and the mul rules. The mul rule can be used only on the input constraints and the constant that you use to multiply is less than or equal to r. This is um, a concept in proof theory called p-simulation. So we say that one proof system can p-simulate another proof system. If given a proof in one proof system, I can produce a proof in the new proof system which is at most polynomial in the length of the proof in the original proof system. So I should be able to p-simulated, which means polynomially simulated. So now let's take a look at the problems that we are studying. First question, how does the div rule affect the size of tree-like cutting plane refutations in horn constraint systems? Second question, how large are tree-like cutting plane refutations of horn constraint systems? Third question, how large are DAG-like uh, cutting plane refutations of on-constraint systems? And finally, what is the computational complexity of determining if an HCS, a on-constraint system, has an R-restricted read once refutation? These were the principal questions that are addressed in the paper. There were a few other theorems too, uh, which we'll probably not be talking about. So there are two things that I need to motivate. One is, why do we need to study horn constraints? Okay, horn constraints are the following applications program verification for abstract interpretation, um, uh, solvers uh, of, for satisfiability modulo theories, declarative programming, econometrics, and um, about 10 years ago when I gave a talk on horn satisfiability, an electrical engineering professor said uh, it's, it occurs in power systems, so I put it down. Okay, I don't know where it's used in power systems, but apparently it is. I then need to motivate um, restricted proof systems. So why do we need proofs at all? Why can't we just say yes and or no when you are given a constraint system? Okay, it is satisfiable, no, it is not satisfiable. Because we want to trust our implementation and when we get a refutation, the refutation acts as a negative certificate. So if it is satisfiable, okay, I can give you a satisfying assignment which you can check. But if I simply say it's unsatisfiable, that is not sufficient. You need to give a certificate, a negative certificate, and that's what these proofs do. So let's briefly cover some related work. Okay, these read once refutations were introduced by Iwama and Miyano. They showed that checking a 3CNF formula, uh, if, it, if a 3CNF formula has a read once refutation is NP hard. Subsequently, it was shown that finding read once refutations for 3 CNF formulas is NP hard even when each resolution step must include a clause with at most two literals, okay. We then showed that finding read once refutations for 2 CNF formulas is NP hard, okay. That was our result. Moving on, uh, it was established by Stefan Zeider that uh, every Horn formula has a read once refutation and uh, it was established by Hans Klein Buning and Sishun Zhao that finding read once unit refutations for Horn formulas is NP hard. We studied uh, read once linear refutations in, un in UTVPI constraint systems sh and we showed that it can be done in polynomial time by a reduction to negative uh, weight perfect matching. 
and this year we showed that finding read once linear and integer refutations for horn constraint systems is NP hard. So that is the state of the art and now we are going to add to that literature in this talk. So what are our contributions? This is the first theorem. We like proofs or refutations using only the add rule do not p simulate tree like proofs using both the add rule and the div rule for horn constraint systems. So essentially what I am saying here is that the add rule by itself will result in proofs that are exponentially long when compared to the proof system which has both add and div. Here is rough proof. So this is the um, constraint system with which we work and this is what we established that any tree like refutation using only the add rule this is done using induction on the number of variables must have at least the, these many steps must and then we show that if you use add and div you can cut it down to 2n minus 1. So you see that there is an exponential gap between the uh, add and div proof system and the add proof system. The next theorem is and this is a three page proof so there is no hope of doing it here. There exist horn constraint systems such that any tree like cutting plane proof which means you can include add and include div is exponential in the size of those systems. So what is the intuition once more we add the variable x0 to the previous horn constraint system stem and then um, the whole point is in this particular system the use of x0 here with coefficient 1 prevents the use of the div rule until x0 itself is eliminated and by then it is too late you have blown up the size of the proof okay? and uh, the proof length becomes exponential. The next theorem is DAG like cutting plane proofs of horn constraint systems, DAG like as opposed to tree like. The whole idea is that inside, I mean if I were to make, give a succinct statement, inside every unsatisfiable horn constraint system is an infeasible difference constraint system just waiting to get out, okay. That is the message you should take with you and that is what is exploited in this proof. And uh, two nice corollaries, one is that every infeasible system of horn constraints has a refutation in which every intermediate step constraint that is derived is horn. So you do not ever need to step outside the realm of horn constraints. You apply the inference rule, you get another horn constraint. You apply more inference rule, you still get horn constraints. Okay? And one more nice corollary is that if I give you a DAG like refutation of length n, then it can always be con converted into uh, a DAG like refutation of length pn where all intermediate constraints are horn. We are going to again skip the proof in the interest of time and the um, now we are going to look at the last result before we do that I want to briefly mention uh, a problem called set packing. This is the set packing problem given a set S and M subsets is there a collection of K subsets that are mutually disjoint. This problem is known to be NP complete and we use that to prove the following theorem. Let R be any positive integer finding R restricted read once refutations is NP hard for horn constraint systems. That is the, the main result. Okay, we do a reduction from set packing. The nice part about the proof that we did is we showed that R in fact can depend on N. So we derive the following, following corollary. Let C be any positive integer finding R restricted read once refutations for horn constraint system is NP hard even when R is allowed to grow it can be very large. See here it is depending on N. Okay. So what is remarkable about this result even if I say so myself is that it can be shown and it was shown in the paper but pulled out because of space restrictions that if you allow R to equal 2 power N minus 1 then any horn constraint system definitely has uh, an R restricted read once refutation. If you pull it down even a little bit then it is NP hard. Here the answer is always yes, here it is NP hard. I do want to make a nice point when I compare this with difference constraints. So in difference constraints you never need to use a constraint more than once that we have shown and 
in case of UTVPI constraints, this was shown in the Algorithmica paper, you never need to use a constraint more than twice in order to arrive at a refutation. What are the important conclusions? Tree-like refutations of horn constraint systems using both the add and div rule can be exponentially more succinct than using only the add rule. Tree-like refutations of horn constraint systems using both add and div rule can be exponentially long in the size of the input. DAG-like refutations of horn constraint systems are polynomial in the size of the input even when you use only add rule. Finding read one's refutations of horn constraint systems is NP hard with a restriction on the use of the MUL rule. And this is something that we showed but we couldn't put in the paper again because of space requirements that you can design uh, an exact exponential algorithm which is parameterized uh, by the defining constant of the system for checking if a read once refutation exists. NP hard problem as mentioned previously. Thank you. In terms of you know, efficiency in deciding these questions, like for example, suppose you want to use it to check the uh, feasibility of a constraint system. Uh, if it was a horn constraint system, can you, I mean, does this give you faster ways to decide it than let's say using it? It depends on the proof system. If you use tree like, worst case exponential. If you use DAG, if you're, if you have a full system like DAG like, then yes, you have a polynomial length proof. The question how does it compare with, let's say, you know, uh, what the SMP is all over the user? So I don't know about SMT solver, but I can describe other algorithms for checking feasibility in horn constraint systems. They are non-certifying. They don't even bother. They just say yes or no. Now we have a method of actually getting a certificate out. So we can actually extract the certificate. That it's unsat, yeah. Um, so I have a question about uh, the Parkas lemma. So you mentioned the Parkas lemma, a way to, to uh, compute uh, a proof of unsatisfiability for conjunction of linear inequalities. Uh, you are all, you, the all clauses uh, are uh, a particular case of uh, this kind of linear constraint. So I'm wondering if, uh, if for all clauses uh, there is a better way than just using uh, a classical, uh, classical linear algebra for, uh, for the fact that uh, some conjunction of linear inequality over the rules is unsatisfiable. So, so you are asking if we can do this for horn clauses? Yes, is it possible to avoid using the Farkas lemma using another technique? So I know of one way reduction, in fact that was there in our pro proposed paper, we took a clausal system and converted it into a horn constraint system. I don't know how to go backward. It may be possible, but I, I, I don't know how to do it.